Jesus shared four lesser-known facts about Satan during his extensive teachings. Initially, he referred to Satan as both the enemy and the evil one in Matthew 13, 39. In the parable of the weeds, recounted in Matthew 13, 24, 30, Jesus illustrated Satan as the enemy who sowed weeds among the wheat while the farmer's workers were asleep. When the workers discovered the weeds, they questioned the farmer, who advised them not to uproot the weeds as it would harm the wheat. Instead, he instructed them to let both grow together until the harvest, at which point the reapers would separate the weeds to be burned and gather the wheat into the barn. Matthew 13, 36, 39. Jesus further explained this story to his disciples, identifying himself as the farmer who planted the good seed, symbolizing the people of the kingdom. He clarified that the weeds represented individuals belonging to the evil one, while the enemy who planted the weeds was the devil. Jesus associated the harvest with the end of the world and described the reapers as the angels. Matthew 13, 36, 39. Throughout history, Satan has been identified as God's specific adversary, continually opposing God's presence and purposes in the world. Scripture acknowledges other enemies of God and his people, including Satan, who is also referred to as the evil one in John 5, 19. However, believers in God are protected from the touch of the evil one, as stated in 1 John 5, 18. In 1 John 2.13, I'm addressing fathers because you are acquainted with the one who has existed since the beginning. I am writing to young men because you have triumphed over the evil one, and I write to children because you have knowledge of the Father. Additionally, in John 12.31, Jesus foretold his impending death and proclaimed that the time for judgment on this world had arrived. The ruler of this world, referring to Satan, would be expelled. Jesus stated that the world was about to crucify the Lord of life and glory, resulting in its own condemnation and the passing of punishment upon guilty humanity. Satan, the ruler of this world, was genuinely defeated at Calvary. Although he continues to carry out his wicked acts, his fate has been sealed. The devil's sentence is yet to be executed, but he will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. As the time of his betrayal approached, Jesus knew he would soon have limited opportunity to speak with his disciples. Satan was drawing near, yet the Savior was aware that the adversary could find no trace of sin within him. There was no aspect of Christ that responded to the devil's evil temptations. It would be unwise for anyone other than Jesus to claim that Satan could find nothing in them. In John 14.30, Jesus declared that he would not say much more as the prince of this world was approaching, but he had no power over him. Satan governs a realm that encompasses both humans and fallen angels who are separated from God. This world includes false religions and poses a threat to genuine followers of God. In 1 John 2.15, 17, we are cautioned not to love the world or the things within it, as such affections do not originate from the Father. The world's desires, including the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions and achievements, do not align with God's will. The world and its cravings will pass away, but those who do God's will shall live eternally. The influence of Satan extends to the world's ideologies, education, and commerce. It manipulates thoughts, ideas, speculations, and the false religions that have emerged from its deceptions and falsehoods. According to Matthew 12, 24 in the Amplified Bible, upon hearing Jesus' actions, the Pharisees accused him of casting out demons with the assistance of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. In Romans 8, 7, 8 also in the Amplified Bible, it states that a mind controlled by the flesh is hostile towards God and does not submit to his laws, making it impossible for those who are governed by their fleshly desires to please God. This world, functioning as a counterpart to God's kingdom and authority, is Satan's creation. His aspiration to be like God led him to sin, and he now leads all rebels who, like him, have fallen into sin. Isaiah 14:14. 14, 14. The purpose of this world is to oppose and undermine the true children of God. As stated in John 8:44 in the Amplified Bible, 
Jesus told those who opposed him that they belonged to their father, the devil. Their actions reflected their father's desires, as he has been a murderer from the beginning and lacks any truth, always speaking lies, as lying is his native language. Lastly, Satan desired to have power over Peter's life. Peter's journey is regarded as one of the most remarkable redemption stories ever told. Although Peter was a fearless and physically active fisherman, he faced a significant challenge as Satan targeted him. At the Last Supper, Jesus warned Peter that a test of faith was approaching, as Satan had requested to sift him like wheat. Luke 22:31. Satan's intention was to violently shake Peter's faith to the point of his downfall, revealing a lack of confidence in the faithful servant of God. However, Peter was not the sole individual in danger of Satan's schemes. In Luke 22:31, Jesus addressed Peter using the plural form and informed him that Satan had set his sights on all the disciples. Some translations, like the Berean Study Bible, explicitly state that Satan requested to sift each of them like wheat. This passage offers insights into an unseen world, raising questions and providing assurances. One crucial assurance is the clear chain of command. God is in control and Satan is constrained. It's worth noting the verb that follows. Satan's name is asked. The outspoken disciples find themselves in a situation similar to Job when Satan sought to test him. Job 1, 2. In Job 1, 1, Satan inquired about Job, acknowledging the hedge of protection placed around him, his household, and his possessions. Satan was curious and asked permission to test Job. Does this alter our perception of the ancient serpent? God will utilize all beings for the good of his kingdom. The word Satan means adversary or accuser, as he accuses God's people of wrongdoing. In Zechariah 3, 1, Satan stood at the right side of the angel of the Lord to accuse Joshua the high priest. In 1 Peter 5, 8, believers are warned to be alert and sober-minded as the devil prowls like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The metaphor of sifting like wheat implies the act of tearing someone apart. In biblical times, wheat or grain was sifted through a sieve or large strainer. During this vigorous shaking, dirt and impurities accumulated from the threshing process were separated from the good, usable grain. Satan's goal in sifting Peter and the other disciples like wheat was to crush them and destroy their faith. In reality, the adversary seeks to undermine the faith of every believer. Jesus assured Peter in John 10.10 10, that the thief, referring to Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, while Jesus himself came to give abundant life. Jesus also conveyed to Peter that he had prayed for him, specifically for his faith not to fail. When Peter turned back, he was to strengthen his brothers. In Luke 22.32, the early church leaders demonstrated that the Lord's prayer for Peter had been answered. Jesus didn't promise to remove the impending test from Peter's path, but instead prayed for his faith not to waver. In the Christian life, tests and trials are to be expected. We must endure various hardships to enter the kingdom of God, as mentioned by the missionaries in Acts 14.22. God utilizes these experiences to mold our character, strengthen our faith, and conform us to the likeness of Jesus. Romans 8.28 in the King James Version assures us that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. James 1.2.4 encourages believers to consider it pure joy when facing trials of many kinds, for the testing of our faith produces perseverance, leading to maturity and completeness. In 1 Peter 1.6.7 In the New King James Version, it is stated that despite experiencing various trials, we can greatly rejoice because the genuineness of our faith is more precious than perishable gold. And through testing, it will result in praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. Jesus is our source of strength and intercedes on our behalf when we face tests, as expressed in Philippians 4.13. It's comforting to know that Christ's intercession limits Satan's ability to sift us like wheat. 
Jesus is always present to intercede for us, as mentioned in Hebrews 7.25, saving to the utmost those who come to God through him. Jesus had faith that Peter would recover from his triple denial and later assist the other disciples. One of the reasons the Lord allows us to go through trials is to equip us to support others in their faith journey, as stated in 2 Corinthians 1, 6. If we experience affliction, it serves for the consolation and salvation of others, and if we are comforted, it is for their consolation. These experiences enable us to empathize and help others endure similar sufferings. Prior to his denial, Peter had been overly confident, relying on his own strength. However, after experiencing the process of being sifted like wheat, Peter came to realize that failure is possible due to the weakness of our human nature. As mentioned in Mark 14, 38, he developed compassion and mercy for others, understanding how easily one can stumble and help them avoid making the same mistake. True faith and perseverance are demonstrated through repentance and restoration, rather than striving for sinless perfection. Just like Peter, we can rise and continue after falling. When Satan attempts to sift us like wheat, we have Jesus Christ as our advocate, interceding on our behalf, as stated in John 17, 9, 11, in the New King James Version. Jesus prayed specifically for those entrusted to him, asking the Holy Father to protect them and keep them united. In John 17, 15, Jesus prayed not for his followers to be taken out of the world, but for them to be kept safe from the evil one. He will safeguard us so that the devil cannot destroy our faith and hope. In John 10, 27, 28, Jesus assures us that his sheep hear his voice, and he knows them, giving them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. Hebrews 7.25 emphasizes that Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him as he continually intercedes for them. Jesus initiated a good work in us and will bring it to completion until the day of his return, as stated in Philippians 1.6. We can be confident that he will see us through until the end. In life, we all face moments of failure, but the important question is how we respond. Many may give up and trade a vibrant life of serving the kingdom for a defeated existence. However, failure does not have to mark the end. It presents an opportunity for a fresh start in the strength of Christ. The enemy's intention was to shake Peter's faith so severely that he would abandon Jesus like worthless chaff. Yet Peter was resolute in keeping his promise to Jesus, even if everyone else turned away, as stated in Mark 14, 29. Satan understands the power of fear and aims to weaken our faith through sifting the faithful. His ultimate goal is to render us useless to God and keep us away from participating in the activities of the Lord's kingdom. To achieve this, he targets our vulnerabilities, areas where we believe ourselves to be invincible or well protected. When the devil succeeds, we become disheartened and demoralized. However, this doesn't have to be the case. If we are willing, God can utilize failure for spiritual purification. Peter humbled himself, drawing strength from the Holy Spirit, and went on to risk public humiliation, persecution, and even death in order to spread the gospel. Failure became a catalyst for increased faith and genuine servitude. It provides great comfort to know that God is always stronger than Satan, and by placing our trust in Him, we can avoid the wrath of the devil and receive the crown of life. But the narrative doesn't end there. God's comforting and hopeful message continues. We need encouragement in our daily struggles to prevent us from forsaking faith and cursing God in times of suffering and weakness. We require assurance that the ups and downs of our faith journey will not result in permanent downfall. In verse 32, Jesus offers us that encouragement and assurance. He addresses Simon directly, acknowledging that Satan has requested to sift him like wheat. However, Jesus assures him that he has interceded in prayer for him, specifically asking that his faith will not fail. Jesus further instructs Simon that after he has returned, he should strengthen his brothers. 
It is reassuring to know that God surpasses Satan in infinite strength, and if we rely on God until the end, He will grant us eternal life. Even more encouraging and hopeful is the fact that Jesus Christ and God the Father are not passive observers waiting to see if we possess the strength to persevere in faith. Notice that Jesus prays to His Father for Simon. The word you in verse 32 is singular, indicating that Jesus is praying specifically for Simon. He pleads with God to provide what is necessary to preserve Simon from destruction. Jesus trusts that his father will respond to his prayer, as he states, and when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Jesus understands that Simon's denial of him will be a temporary weakness, a fleeting moment of wavering confidence followed swiftly by bitter tears of repentance, as described in Luke 22, 62. The Father allowed Satan to sift Simon, but in response to Jesus' prayer, he did not allow Simon to fall completely through the sieve. Here, we see the dual weapon of hope and encouragement that God gives us. We are not defenseless against the enemy, nor are we left to uphold the shield of faith solely with our own strength. God will always ensure that faith emerges victorious and that His children maintain their faith. This is the significance of the powerful passage in 1 Peter 1, 3, 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His abundant mercy, has brought us forth again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an incorruptible and undefiled inheritance that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater and more powerful than all. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. John 10, 27, 30, Amplified Bible. He who is strengthened becomes the strengthener. Our joy in the promises of God always multiplies when it overflows from the depths of our lives and touches others. And what about the other ten apostles? This can teach us a lot. Sometimes, God deals with you directly in the early hours of the morning, strengthening your faith in solitude. However, more often, God strengthens our faith through another person. He sends us a Simon Peter who brings us the exact word of grace we need to continue, Psalm 35. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If you have found this content valuable, I kindly ask for your support through your subscription so that you do not miss any of our upcoming videos. Together we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.